so I'm Les Weisbrod. Um, this is Kurt Johnson, um, Congresswoman's son. Um, I want to share a few things with you um, in addition to what was in the press release. For one thing, we have the uh, death certificate uh, to hand out today. The cause of death is listed as osteomyelitis, the lumbar spine. Osteomyelitis is an infection. Um, that goes along with what was in the press release about the culture results that uh, Congresswoman died from an infection that was acquired at the Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation, uh, where unfortunately um, she was left in her own feces. Um, I also want to play for you now a um, voicemail that was left on Kirk's phone from a case manager at the Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation on September 21, uh, the day that this happened. Um, this will just be a minute or two, but I think it'll be self-explanatory. For the care partner meeting, um, your sweet poor mom was in the middle of definitely, um, um, I don't even know what I would call it, but uh, again, I'm deeply, deeply sorry that that's uh, the situation that you found herself in, and um, uh, my prayers is that um, they were able to uh, clean her up and that she's, um, but I, from my, the schedule I'm showing, she's supposed to be in therapy at this time. So I just really wanted to touch base with you um, because I was hoping that we could really talk just in regards to planning. We're going to have Mom's um, team conference again next Tuesday because we have it every week. Um, and I just didn't know if maybe you wanted to try to um, let some time go because, you know, we're still in the beginning and her continuing to do therapy. So we can maybe re -touch, you know, touch base again maybe next Tuesday. Um, I could go to her room and I could maybe see her towards the end and maybe we can meet around 1.30 on Tuesday. Um, let me know if that works um, for you or not. Um, again, my deeply, deep, my deepest apologies for uh, the situation that mom was in and that uh, we couldn't find staff. Um, I, I don't, there are no words to be honest with you. Um, all I know is um, that her tech that was assigned was with another patient because when I found her and she came to help the other tech, she was like, I'm sorry, I was with another patient. And um, anyhow, um, Again, uh, I know that I would I would feel the same way as you um, because that, that's our mom, right? So um, hope to talk to you soon as we can continue to make sure that we are looking at the best care for mom and what are going to be her needs um, as we get ready to go home. Um, and again, we'll we'll talk about it again next week on the 28th. Okay? Um, or excuse me, I'm sorry, Tuesday the 26th. Thank you so much. You have a good one. Bye bye. So the um, final thing uh, that we have for you this afternoon is uh, a copy of Dr. Park's medical record um, that contains what was quoted in the press release um, concerning uh, what Kirk uh, found uh, and went through and his um, conversations and complaints uh, at the time um, to the uh, administrative people at the uh, Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation. Um, with that, um, we're here to answer your questions, so uh, feel free. Kirk, what did you find that day? Tell us what you found. Well, I had an appointment scheduled with the caseworker at one o'clock to discuss her progress but before I got there uh, she had called me saying that she needed help she couldn't get anybody to respond to the button that calls the nurse it takes me about 10 to 12 minutes to drive from home to 
the facility and when I got there, she was still in that same condition. We waited, I pressed the button, no one responded. So at that point I left and went out to the nursing station and there was no one there. A few minutes later I finally was approached by a young lady, I can't give you her name but she had on a Baylor smock and she went and found some of the nurses and came back and told me that they were in training and that they would be out shortly. It was at that point I said, I need to speak with someone else. And I was directed to the administrative office on the first floor of the facility. And I told him and asked him, would he accompany me to see what her condition was? And he did. What did you find her condition to be when you got there? Deplorable. She was being unattended to. She was screaming out in pain and for help. Um, you took her to Baylor Scott and White expecting what? Excellent care? That's what they told me would happen there. Well, and, and she was operated on at Medical City Heart and Spine by Dr. Park originally. Um, he did a uh, four level surgery, L2 through L5, where he put hardware um, into her spine to stabilize it. Um, she needed that surgery because uh, she had stenosis, spondylosis, and scoliosis, which are degenerative conditions. And uh, without that surgery, um, she was at risk for not being able to walk. So, uh, the surgery though went well and within two, three days after the surgery she was up walking. And so then uh, Dr. Park sent her from uh, Medical City Heart and Spine to the Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation which is standard uh, post that kind of spinal surgery uh, and it's usually anticipated that that will be an admission for about a week where they're getting her strength up and she's working with physical therapy one to two weeks and then she was expected uh, to go home and be fine. Um, and instead, she got this infection uh, at the Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation uh, because they didn't protect her wound um, properly and because they left her in her own feces unattended and then uh, the uh, evidence of that is in the cultures that were done both at Baylor Institute of Rehabilitation. Then she was transferred back to Medical City uh, Spine and Heart because they had to go in and debreed the wound, open it up, put in um, antibiotics, and, and they had her on IV antibiotics really from the point that the infection occurred until uh, she died. She was on antibiotics. Uh, it couldn't overcome the infection. Um, not only did they go in and debreed and clean out the infection, Dr. Park had to remove all the hardware he put in um, for fear it was infected and then replace it all. And that's a very uh, complex, difficult surgery to go through twice um, particularly for someone Eddie Bernice's age. Um, and uh, then she went from uh, Medical City uh, spine and heart uh, to a skilled nursing facility, uh, the Village of Lake Highlands, where she was at for a couple of months until she was uh, sent home on hospice uh, care. And so we have to, I'm sorry, the, the timeline, right? When was the surgery and the initial surgery? And and when did she start having problems? And this, can you this, put some dates to them? This happened at, at uh, Baylor Rehab the day that uh, this happened and I played that uh, recording from was September 21, 2023. 
the surgery was September 11th. And then the second surgery, do you remember? It would have been the following Monday, wasn't it? It would have been Monday after the 21st. Yeah. And I believe she went into hospice this past Friday? No, Friday. she went into hospice December 20th. I believe, yes. That, that Monday. That the Monday before Christmas. The Monday before Christmas. So in light of her passing, it's safe to say that this was going to be an imminent lawsuit, whether she was still alive or not. Well, the care. well um, Eddie Bernice and I go way back. I've known her since I was 15 years old. That's 55 years. Um, my father was her uh, accountant, and uh, I've been her personal attorney basically since I got to law school. Um, and uh, she was very familiar with my cases, very interested in it. She was a, a nurse, as you know, and um, uh, she knew what happened to her. We discussed it, and she asked me to uh, pursue a case for her um, weeks ago. And uh, of course, I thought it was going to be a case for uh, the pain that she went through and the additional procedures she went through and the medical bills, and that she was going to recover. So uh, it's very distressing for me that. Um, that she succumbed to this. What were those conversations that you had with her um, when she knew what was happening and that this was a result of that? Well, um, I mean simply that she understood and that uh, she wanted accountability. Kurt, your mother was the first registered nurse elected for Congress. The parallel of this being a medical related thing of somewhere somewhere somebody somewhere dropped the ball of not attending to her how do you how do you feel knowing that as far as your mom having a background of helping people in a medical sense and this happened mm -hmm. well I think it's ironic that for a registered nurse who is a member of the Academy of Nursing to have been treated that way How does it feel for you to see your mother in that condition when you when you found her in that condition for you as a son walking in? You can't imagine. What were her symptoms following the infection if she had any? Well, um, she had intense pain. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was that uh, she developed a fever. Um, she had uh, purulent drainage from her wound. Uh, prior to the infection, the drainage from her wound was clear. Um, it's called serosanguis, a clear fluid. And then uh, following the infection, it was a purulent uh, drainage. and. Um, you know, they, they, uh, you'll see from the record that uh, we're handing out from Dr. Park that uh, there were drains that were placed in the wound, um, you know, to try to fight the infection and, uh, and get it out. Um, you know, it's, it's just a nightmare that um, you wouldn't want anybody to have to go through. Is the family planning to have a, like a private autopsy or autopsy with Dallas County? No, I mean the uh, the death certificate is there. We know what happened. Um, you know, I've I've been in constant communication with Dr. Park. Uh, Dr. Park uh, is convinced that the cause of her death was um, this incident where uh, she was left in her own feces and her wound wasn't protected. Is there any other uh, evidence regarding that cause of death? Um, uh, besides, I know the, the different culture tests that were taken at the two facilities, but any other evidence that's pointing to that as you know the cause of death? 
I don't know whether there evidence there would be. <laughs> that's, uh, I mean, those culture results, that's almost like DNA, you know? Uh, it's the crime scene. It's, uh, it's all there. The way you describe this, it sounds like a pretty intensive surgery with what I would imagine would be a pretty significant wound. What were they doing to protect the wound while she was healing? Well, they weren't doing enough. <laughs> And uh, obviously that wound, uh, the dressing needs to be changed, you know, regularly and it needs to be kept to where uh, nothing can get in there. Um, and that just, that just wasn't what happened. And certainly uh, you can't allow somebody, uh, you know, to sit uh, in uh, feces and urine for a prolonged period of time. Um, I had my back operated on by Dr. Park uh, earlier in the summer and uh, you know I wasn't allowed to uh, take a bath for two months uh, because you got to protect that wound mm -hmm. so you know I, th I think uh, I think that explains it with any sort of surgery there's a risk of infection do you think that uh, Baylor fell short in protecting uh, her from other sorts of Well, she didn't get any other infection. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, all of the evidence is that uh, the infection she got was from the feces. Mm -hmm. And that's part of why it's so unforgivable. Are you aware if there's any other similar incidents that have happened at this rehabilitation facility similar to what happened to uh, Paul Congressman? I am not. Kirk, do you believe if you hadn't have found your mother in that state that day that she would still be alive today? She had no reason to not have been here without, if she had gotten proper care at that facility, she would be here today. When was the last time, Kirk, you were able to have a conversation with your mother? And, and, um, how tough has this been on you? Well, Christmas Day. Christmas Day. Was she aware of how things were going? You know, she was in hospice at the end. Did she recognize that things yeah, were she not did. going well? She, she thought that she wouldn't live three weeks, and she did. Did I understand you to say that the nurses had indicated to you that they were in training at that time? Is that what their issue was? Why they weren't present in the room? With That's them? what I was told on that day. I have no idea what they were really doing. They they weren't there. They weren't on the floor. He couldn't find any of them on the floor, and he was subsequently told they were all in a training session. And uh, as you heard from the tape recording, from the uh, case manager uh, that called and left the voicemail. Uh, she said that the uh, tech was in another room. Um, so, I mean, basically nobody was there and uh, Congresswoman was abandoned. Can you clarify something, please? I keep hearing nurses weren't there. It's the techs that take care of the patients, not the nurses, correct? Both, tech and nurse. So there should be both tech and a nurse available in there, particularly when she's hitting the call button, that goes to a nurse. No nurse responded. Well, it goes to a desk, and the desk assigns it. And there wasn't anyone at the desk? Correct. It so, goes to a desk where a nurse is sitting. So what's the process from here? Well, as we put in the press release, um, under Texas law, it's mandatory that we send a pre-suit notice letter. That was done today. The purpose of the uh, pre-suit notice letter. There's a statutory 60-day waiting period. The purpose of that is to give the parties an opportunity uh, to resolve uh, the matter uh, prior to actually filing a lawsuit. I have been in touch uh, with in-house counsel at uh, Baylor Scott & White Health uh, System as well as counsel for uh, the Baylor Rehabilitation Institute, which is, uh, as we put in the release, 
uh, operated by uh, Select Rehabilitation uh, Inc. Um, and uh, they have assured me that they want to uh, work toward a resolution. And um, I've, I've, uh, I've dealt with uh, these people over the years a lot <laughs> on a lot of cases. I think they're uh, reputable uh, people. They've expressed sympathy for what occurred. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm hopeful it will be worked out. And as we put in the uh, release, um, anybody that knew Congresswoman knew that she uh, worked to build consensus. Um, she would uh, like to have always a peaceful resolution of any conflict. Um, but she was going to stand up for her rights. You know, she, uh, she filed lawsuits over redistricting and things like that. And um, uh, she, she, wanted, she wanted everybody to, you know, um, to, get, to get their rights. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful we'll be able to reach a resolution. Do you have an estimate of how long she was unattended in that bed? Well, I mean, Kirk says that uh, when she called him, um, she'd already been uh, trying to get somebody for probably 15 or 20 minutes. Then she called him, and he didn't get over there for about 15 minutes. So, uh, and then when he got there, he couldn't find anybody. So, um, my guesstimate is that she was unattended for about an hour. That's At a any long point. time to be lying in a condition like that and being exposed to infection. And that's then that's why she got infected, and that's unfortunately why she died. At any point, because I know sometimes at um, different facilities, they may mention how often a person is going to be checked on. Did anybody, you know, let the family know how often these checks would happen? Um, any, any time frame, maybe she'd be checked on every hour? When she was initially uh, taken to Baylor, that was going to be regular, is what they told us. That turned out not to be the case. Do you have an idea in mind of what would be the ideal resolution in this case? Um, I don't know exactly. Um, I think one of the things that we're interested in doing is um, creating a foundation in Congresswoman's name that would help fund some of the um, programs and activities that were dear to her heart um, in, in addition to the, uh, the damages that are due under the law. And you mentioned the damages um, uh, under the Texas law for medical negligence are capped at $250,000. You mentioned that that is something that needs to change, but if it were to come down to that, how much would you all be seeking? Well, um, the law is the law. It's a terrible law. It, this is uh, an illustration of how unfair that law is that a person like Eddie Bernice Johnson who dedicated her life to service of others and was really an American hero. There's a cap of $250,000 uh, plus the past medical bills. The only other additional thing would be punitive damages. And in order to get punitive damages, you have to try the case to a jury and have a unanimous 12-person uh, jury. For punitives, you don't need a unanimous jury for liability and regular damages, but under Texas tort reform, you do for punitives. So uh, the, uh, the options are limited uh, due to the law. Congresswoman was against that law. Um, and I think she would be, um, I think she would be 
happy if uh, if all of this that happened to her helped change that law. Is it your desire to pursue this to that extent? Do you think that's what's necessary under these circumstances? Well, you know, as the UN, that's the legislative. It, 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 you know, that's that's a I'm legislative. I'm not talking about fix. the legislature. I'm talking about going to a jury and getting punitive damages and trying to get it in there. As well, like I said, I'm hopeful that uh, that we'll reach a resolution even before we actually have to file the lawsuit. And what does so it perhaps show that might set up the fund that you suggest <coughs> or something like that. Why was it so important that you got this letter out four days after her death and before funeral services um, and shared it in this way? Well, and Kirk may be able to speak to this too, but I think that um, we thought it was important um, that people knew what happened and that, uh, you know, to go through the whole funeral service and all of the publicity and not have everybody know uh, what happened, um, we just didn't think that was right, number one. Number two, um, Congresswoman and Kirk and the family, they don't want this to happen to anybody else. So by putting this story out, um, if this prevents this from happening to one other person, then that would be what she would have wanted, and that's what the family wants. I know you mentioned the, the cause of death uh, for the death certificate. Was there also sepsis uh, by chance? The, the, I mean, the only thing listed on there is osteomyelitis of the lumbar spine, which is infection. Okay, I think I think I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you.